an honor today to introduce one of the most influential speakers of the year, Mr. Peter Economides. Mr. Economides is a brand strategist with a global perspective. He has lived on four continents doing work that has impacted brands and consumers everywhere. He has worked with and learned from the leaders of the, some of the world's best brands. Owner and founder of Felix BNI, which is based in Athens, Mr. Economides is a former executive vice president and worldwide director of client services at global advertising agency Macan Ericsson Worldwide and head of global clients TBWA Worldwide, where he structured and rolled out the global clean kitchen campaign for Apple after Steve Jobs' return. Mr. Economides' work is focused on change, on the strategic responses to shifting culture, consumer habits and behavior, and the challenges of regional and global expansion. His favorite motto is everything communicates. Having said that, I'd like to invite him to communicate with us. Let's give him a warm welcome. This is, this is really amazing being here. I love it. Um, talking to a group of people like you is just great. It's really what gives me a huge kick. Um, over the past few months, I guess I've become Mr. Yinet. <laughs> and the reason, it all started with this speech I gave at Google when I, I said that the most common word in the Greek language is the one that starts with an M. <laughs> and the second most common, yeah, common one is the then unit eh? And sometimes we use them together and we say, the then unit did it, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and then I kind of reminded people that Piros Dimas did not say, the then unit eh? Football team in 2004 didn't say the unit. Eh? And when you guys go into write your exams, you know they say the unit. Eh? Some of you might. <laughs> and when they built the Acropolis, they certainly did not say the unit eh? because unit. Eh? And we've got to make it happen. Okay? Today it's not about unit, eh? it's about learning organizations. I'm not an organizational theorist, I am a marketing guy. Um, I've spent my life in a very creative industry called advertising and I've worked with some of the greatest clients in the world. I've been very lucky. Guys like Steve Jobs, Sergio Zeman from Coca-Cola and I worked with the amazing Bill Dragos, Dragos, who is the founder of TBWA, which was an amazing agency. By the way, that was a learning organization par excellence. Okay? It, uh, when, when Bill started it, he started in Paris. And from the beginning, it was a multicultural learning agency. There were four founders. One, the Greek, Tregos. Bonange, which is the B, French, obviously. Vicendanga, Swiss. Ajroldi, Italian. So four guys from different nationalities, this is whistling a bit, no? Yeah. Got together, and from different disciplines. Paul was a management guy. Uh, Bonange, Claude Bonange was a strategist. Vicendanga was a creative guy. Ajroldi was a client management person. They got together and started this agency in Paris. And as they grew, Bill always used to say to me, I took the example from Alexander the Great. Wherever we went, we try to learn from people. We try to become more than we were. So as this agency grew to become one of the largest in the world, it learned. It learned. And because it learned, it became one of the best agencies in the world. Okay? I'm talking, by the way, about the agency that did Absolute Vodka, about the agency where I was involved, lucky guy, with jobs doing Think Different, the relaunch of Apple, uh, and many other clients, Sony PlayStation, all sorts of wonderful stuff, okay? That was a learning organization, par excellence. Any Twitter writer here? That's my username. Yeah. And we've agreed a hashtag of DairyBW, okay? So if you're going to make a note of those, and go ahead and tweet. I mean, it's cool, Sherry, it's learning. I'm going to be with you for about an hour. I'm going to try to keep my talk uh, reasonably short. Um, I sometimes ramble on just telling you to shut up. And then uh, we'll have some time for questions and stuff, okay? That's where I went to university. <laughs> One of the most beautiful cities in the world. Cape Town. Table Mountain in the middle. And I used to live where the red arrow is. And I'm showing you this over here. Whoops, no roving mic. <laughs> that over there is, is a beat. That's about 20 minutes from there to there, okay? And, and when I was writing exams, I used to love driving down this coast road, which is really magnificent. 
and going to that beach, which I'm going to show you, and hanging out, okay, and watching the sunset. And I do that every night. So I really, I was working hard, and I'd drive down the coast, beautiful drive, and go and hang out on those rocks and just like ease my mind. And it became a beautiful routine that I did every day, okay? I went down one day, and that's what happened. <laughs> okay? That, by the way, is a puff adder. Anybody from South Africa? Any South Africans here? Yeah. Where? How's it, Brooke? How's it, Bell? Okay. So, my lack of Like a cracker. Good donkey. Okay, we speak a weird language. <laughs> we don't even understand it. <laughs> so, anyway, I come across this, this puff adder. A puff adder is a fatal, a fatal mistake. Very lazy, but it strikes in a moment, and it's extremely, extremely fast. And when it strikes, it's got fangs which are really long. It sinks its fangs into you, and very often you can't remove it. It just sticks into you, okay? And you've got like 20 minutes. Okay? Now, 20 minutes is the distance from where I was back to my house. Never mind to the city. I was in trouble. I was in big trouble. It was a crisis. Huge proportions. Okay. It was a disruption because my routine was disrupted. I suddenly had to deal with something that I wasn't used to dealing with. Okay? Because it was just a pleasant walk down at the beach. That's what it was. It's like I had this in front of me. Huge disruption. And when things are disrupted and you've got a life threatening condition in front of you, the adrenaline starts pumping and you become much smarter than you've ever been in your life before. Your capacity to think through things is remarkable. And I made decisions which took me a nanosecond, but the analysis I went through would have taken me hours in real life. Because suddenly, you're on the edge. Okay? I decided not to fight with this snake, because I might have lost. And if I lost, the consequences would have been disastrous. So I decided to slip myself into the snake's state of mind. And I just start to imagine how he felt so that I could respond in a way that would be comfortable for him. So I said to myself, he doesn't want me here, just like I don't want him here. Okay? And I pretended that I hadn't seen him. Believe me, I'm scared of pictures of snakes. <laughs> I lifted my foot up and I stepped over him and I carried on walking. Okay? It was the smartest decision I ever made. If I'd backed off, I would have frightened him. Most likely he would have gone for me. If I'd attacked him, he probably would have won. And I wouldn't be speaking to you today. Disruption. Disruption. Disruption is when all of a sudden, lazy organizations have a need to become learning organizations. Okay? Because most of the time we coast along. Everything's okay. No problem. The other popular thing to express, no problem. Well, when there's a disruption, you've got a huge problem. You have to deal with it. You have to create your way out of the crisis. You've got to think. You can't just do your way out. You've got to create a way out. Because you've been disrupted. And under those circumstances, learning is not compulsory. But no survival. So if you want to survive, you've got to learn fast. You've got to create fast. Ask the music business. <laughs> the music business, when internet music started appearing, digital music, the reaction of the record business was to fight with the snake. And they lost. So they went out and they hired armies of lawyers to try to shut down internet music services. And they lost. The snake bit them. Ask anybody whom you might know working in the music business, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Mr. Jobs, on the other hand, one of my heroes, as you can understand, uh, created the largest, the world's largest record store. He doesn't sell records, he sells down there. Okay? The music business is suffering. There's a huge disruption happening in the music business. The music companies used to exist because they used to have big factories 
printing vinyl discs, which needed distribution by trucks. All of a sudden, music is digital. You upload it, you download it. All of us can record music. There's no more reason for the music business. They didn't learn. They didn't learn. They were bitten by the snake. I want to read you one of the most famous quotes. Any marketing students here? This over here is an article which was published in 1960, Theodore Levitt, Northwestern University, I believe. And what he said is the following. The railroads did not stop growing because the needs of passenger and freight transportation declined. That grew. <coughs> the railroads are in trouble today, not because the need was filled by others, cars, trucks, airplanes, even telephones, but because it was not filled by the railroads themselves. They let others take customers away from them because they assumed themselves to be in the railroad business rather than in the transportation business. The reason they defined the industry incorrectly was because they were railroad orientated. They were product orientated, not customer oriented. <coughs> Just like the music business was record orientated, not music oriented. This over here, to me, is one of the most dramatic disappearances, uh, especially for somebody of my generation. I was not born with digital, okay? Most of you guys probably don't know there was film at some point. <laughs> they had little roles. <laughs> um, Kodak was synonymous with photography. They went bankrupt the other day. Yeah. They went bankrupt. Why? Let's revisit marketing myopia. Photographic film did not stop growing because the needs of buyers and sellers declined. That grew. Kodak is in trouble today, not because the need was filled by others, Panasonic, Sony, Canon, Nikon, but because it was not filled by Kodak themselves. They let others take customers away from them because they assumed themselves to be in the film business rather than in the image business. The reason they defined the industry incorrectly was because they were film oriented. They were product oriented, not customer oriented. Okay? What do all those brands have in common? Anybody? Places you worked at. I'm sorry? Places you worked at. No. no. <laughs> Some of them. <coughs> They're all famous. Global, global brands. Okay, these are the top ten global brands. I'm sorry. I guess they follow needs. That's why they are top ten. Okay. And let me just show you this chart. By the way, every year a company called Interbrand does this survey, and it measures the most powerful global brands. The measure looks at the ongoing investment and management of the brand as a business asset. Ongoing investment and management which means the ability to create sustained value over time, okay? Which means the ability to learn. So you don't like do something great go out of business. <coughs> you learn and you evolve, okay? Mm -hmm. Number one, Coca-Cola, IBM, Microsoft, Google, General Electric, McDonald's, Intel, these are the top 20, excuse me, Apple, Disney, HP, let's stop there, that's the top 10, okay? Now, what these brands have in common <coughs> is their ability to learn. These brands understand, by the way, I, I missed something. Do you notice over here? Sometimes these brands are in competition with each other. And you see it directly here. Look at Apple. Apple rose from number 17 to number eight. Okay? At the same time that Nokia went from number eight to number 14. The value of Apple's brand went up 58%. Whereas the value of Nokia's brand went down 15%. So clearly we know what happened. <laughs> Apple screwed Nokia. <laughs> okay? Because a computer company launched a brilliant phone and disrupted the phone business, just like the snake in my path. And Nokia didn't know what to do. Okay? They didn't fight. They didn't step over the snake. They waited too long. And Apple grew. Okay? I'm sorry. And they had the technology. Of course they had the technology. So did, so did Kodak. <laughs> and that's my point. Your biggest competitor is not your competitors. Your biggest competitor is tomorrow. And there's a threat which every single business is faced with today. And if 
Every single business does not deal with that threat. They are in huge mortal danger. Okay? Just like a snake in your palm. By the way, the great companies of the world, you're going to find funny titles inside them, like Department of the Future. Okay? Like Chief Learning Officer. Like Chief Listening Officer. These companies take what they're doing seriously. By the way, we had at TVWA a Department of the Future. Okay? We never saw them because they came in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know what that is? Yeah. Yeah. Hands up. Let's see how tech savvy you guys are. Is this a university or what? <laughs> I mean, you guys should all know that. That's a QR code. Okay? That QR code um, is disruptive. Is disruptive. Anybody know what that is? What is it? Yeah. Uh, it's a shop that only has uh, the products on the wall, and you take the QRs, and then they come delivered to your the home. The man's got it. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah. That is a subway station in South Korea, which is one of the most technologically advanced countries on the planet, from a consumer technology point of view. And that over there is a supermarket, but it's a billboard. That over there is a train door, so I'm getting into a train. Mm -hmm. That over there is a poster. And it's got supermarket shelves with QR codes. Mm -hmm. So you're waiting for your train, you take your iPhone or your Android, <laughs> and you kind of like hold it up and you point at things and it orders them for you. And when you get home, it stuff's waiting for you. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Is that a snake for supermarkets? You damn right. <laughs> Damn right. The world is for this next. That's a great visual. That is such a beautiful visual. I found that on the internet a couple of days after he died. It's just beautiful. Um, you know, most of us know Steve Jobs because of what he did over the past few years. But in, his genius goes way back. Way back. It starts with really the first PC which he made the first, truly personal computer, which was an Apple II. And, and then it goes on to the, the Macintosh, which was launched in 1984, which was truly a revolution. It was the first machine with Windows. It was the first machine with a mouse. And it was launched in 1984. And I'm going to show you the commercial with which it was launched. The day we celebrate the first glorious anniversary of the information for filmmaking as good as it gets. All right? It doesn't get much better than that. That was back in 1984. It's obviously a reference to George Orwell's book about uh, Big Brother. Big Brother is IBM. That's pretty clear. And um, IBM then was ruling big time. It was the year, it was also the time of mainframe for my book. Uh, you don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Am I getting old or <laughs> And uh, you guys are still going to get here. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's as good as it gets, right? That commercial is a benchmark. It is held up as a benchmark. Any ad guy will say, that's my dream, to make a movie like that. The production budget was $900,000, which at the time was a huge amount of money. Uh, it was done by Ridley Scott. Ridley Scott, the famous British director. And the spot appeared once on the Super Bowl. It reached an audience of approximately 50 million people. 
and was hailed at the time as being a revolution in advertising. It's a very famous campaign. It launched Macintosh. We all know the process of making videos like that. We all know it. We know exactly what needs to be done. Very few of us have the talent. I checked yesterday, it's 440 million. My humble little video on rebranding Greece has got something like 270,000 views. I feel very humble about this. That's huge. Okay. We all have the talent to make videos. <laughs> very few of us have the process. And even fewer have the balls. <laughs> I, I cannot imagine a single marketing director having an agency come along and present a story. Well, you see, there are two kids, the one bites the other one's finger, and blah, 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 blah. I'll say, you're nuts. They'll fire them. I can't imagine an agency team being courageous enough to actually come up with that story and then go and propose it to a client because they're scared that they're going to be scared of getting fired. I mean, we just can't deal with that stuff. We haven't learned how to deal with it. But there's a snake in the path called YouTube. And it's called the internet. And that's our biggest competitive threat tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to my job? Why the face? We won't trust. I've got a quiz for you guys. Is that a flower exporter? Yes or no? <laughs> Any takers? No. 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 Is that a Bollywood producer? Yes or no? No. no. Yes. No. What's his name? What movie is it? <laughs> is that the president of the third largest nation on earth? Yeah. Uh, yes. That guy is Hu Jintao, the supreme leader of China. This guy is Manmohan Singh, the Prime Minister of India. <laughs> Facebook. If Facebook was a country, it would be the third largest in the world. Look at that. Facebook, 800 million. <coughs> United States, 314. Facebook is bigger than the USA, Brazil, Russia, Japan, <laughs> Germany, and France combined. By the way, Zuckerberg was born in 1984. Four months and 13 days after that Macintosh commercial was ran once in the Super Bowl. What the fuck? <laughs> Facebook has grown from 1 million users to 8 million in the space of 8 years. 800 million. Did I say eight? Yes. I didn't sleep too well last night. <laughs> Facebook is the size of the entire internet in 2004. Facebook is just the tip of the iceberg. That's what's lurking underneath the surface. Those are all social media properties. And if you count them, they're about 120. And that's a little out of date, that was yesterday. <laughs> 
Social media is not about media. I think it's the worst name on the world to call it in the world to call it media. It's about a fundamental shift in the way that consumers think, feel, and behave. This consumer can make you or break you. Ask her that. <laughs> you can't ask him, he's gone. Ask Mulbach. What the fuck? If you're not scared, then you're not paying attention. There's a lot to be scared of. There's a lot to be scared of. But nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. That's Marie Curie. Everything has changed. On Facebook, we find friends, we like, we comment, and we share. Nothing has changed. It's the Café Neum. <laughs> Think about it. The Café Neum is where you find friends, you like, you comment, and you share. This is the Café Neum on steroids. <laughs> You can't walk into a cafe now like that. You get kicked straight out. <laughs> Hi guys! <laughs> I said, do me a favor, get out of here. Right? Doesn't work. It needs a different kind of mindset. And this is the challenge that organizations have got in front of them. All of them. How to win friends and influence people, a book that was written in the 50s by Dale Carnegie. Look what he says. What are the six ways of making people like you? See pages 73 to 128. <laughs> what are the 12 ways of bringing people to your way of thinking? See pages 131 to 209. What are the nine ways to change people without giving offense or rising resentment? See pages 213 to 243. That, to me, is the management bible for what's going on today. And it shouldn't come as a surprise that two of the best-selling books on the New York Times list last year were two. One by Gal Kawasaki called Enchantment, the second one by a remarkable guy called Gary Vaynerchuk, called The Thank You Economy. I hosted a conference, by the way, in, uh, in Istanbul in December, and there were both speakers on that conference. My friend Marcus over here was there. Marcus actually is a wine producer. Uh, Gary Vaynerchuk has got a wine store. He's increased the size of this, his family's business using Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, from $3 million a year to $45 million a year in two years. Marcus actually went over to New York, understanding the power of this guy, and he got Greek wines on him. And what he did was great. That's marketing today. That's marketing. It's an open world. And the challenge to organizations today is to become open organizations. It's a huge challenge. It's huge. The art of marketing today is listen, speak, learn, share, give more than you take. And there's something called soft power, which is creating a certain magnetism around yourself. It's about people liking you. It's about people wanting to be close to you. That's what marketing is. A brand, very simple, it's reputation. If you spend six months trying to figure out what a brand is, my apologies to your professors. <laughs> I think it's just reputation. I'm super fair. Branding is reputation management. It's being aware of the fact that everything you say and everything you don't say communicates. That's managing your reputation. Because you've got a brand, whether you like it or not. Everything communicates. What you say, what you don't say, what you do, what you don't do, how you say it, and how you do it. All of that communicates. And in my talk about rebranding Greece, I talk about Papa Andrea and Samaras fighting with each other in front of the world, they were building brand in the wrong direction. Or when Kuduris, the guy with the mascara, <laughs> was stopped by a cop and he tried to run him over. <laughs> or when Nikitiadis did a deal. Anybody related to Nikitiadis? <laughs> or when he did a deal are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> when he did a deal um, to print 7 million placemats and put them into diners on the east coast of America, uh, not thinking that mm -hmm. placemats are meant to keep tables clean, which 
means that when you're eating your wonderful juicy burger, I'm drops the ketchup and the mustard, a bit of lettuce, on top of the picture of the Acropolis, which says there's a grease at the top. So it's still in my Today's world looks like this. It's not a broadcast world. There is no God of marketing. Okay? There are lots of influence circles. And the trick that marketers need to learn, and it's not easy, is how to get into those social networks. Making TV commercials like Apple, are, it's easy. It's easy. We know the process. If we've got the talent, we can make great commercials. Understanding how to make little videos with two kids biting each other's fingers off is tough. That's what gets you into those circles. And that's where things happen today. Okay. That's going to keep on happening that way. We need to find the influencers. You've got to find them. You've got to know who they are. Okay. And here there's an incredible, val incredibly valuable tool. It's also proof that my education did not go wasted. These are all the things that I learned at university. That's the normal distribution curve, which on the left-hand side, that's 0%, that's 100%. That's how product penetrates the market. Okay, it reaches saturation over there. On that side, you're talking to the innovators, who are approximately 2.5% of the total population. The early adopters, 13.5%. This is mass market, the early, the early majority, 34%, late majority, 34%, the laggards, 16%. And this theory is all about how far it starts there, goes through there, and finally lands up there. Right. Those guys are the fanatics, those are the visionaries, those are the pragmatists, the conservatives, and the skeptics. And I'm going to give you an example of how this works with the iPhone. <laughs> When a new iPhone is released, there are always a bunch of people who are waiting outside the store. They don't even know what it looks like. Yeah. Okay? They haven't eaten for two weeks. <laughs> Partly out of armcores, and the other part is because they want to save up the money and get themselves a phone. Okay? They don't know what on earth it's going to do. And they're sitting outside the store, and they're like really cool, and they're like really happy, because they're going to be the first guys out of the store with a new iPhone. Right? <laughs> That's those guys. The next group of guys are probably guys like most of us in this room, who will say, ah, oh, that's cool, that's got, uh, that's got the internet, I can probably use that. And we'll take the risk and we'll buy it because it's got a good brand name behind it. We'll say, okay, fine, you know, they, they wouldn't sell me rubbish, it's probably going to work and it could be useful in my life, so I'll take the risk and I'll go for it, right? They're ahead of the curve. The next group are the guys who go to dinner with the other guys, and they say, gee, look at my cool phone. And they say, wow, you've got to have one, all right? Because the guys over here actually work for the brand, and they sell it to these guys over here, right? That's how things work. See my new cool app, see what this thing does, got to have one. These guys are, wow, the neighbor's got one, I've got to get one too. <laughs> these guys, forget about them, they like iPhone, you know, what are you talking about, right? <laughs> These guys, yeah, yeah, just forget about them. That's where the action is. That's where the action is, okay? That's where new organizational uh, practice is born. That's where, uh, within an organization, the innovators arise from. That's where entrepreneurs come from. That's where innovation starts, and it travels along that curve and reaches the other side, okay? And by the time it gets here, it's old hat because your grandmother's doing it. You don't want to do what your grandmother's doing. Now, I speak to a lot of marketing people as a brand person, like that's my job, and you'll be amazed how many marketing directors I speak to who want me to advise them on social media, and I say, what's your Facebook name? And they say, I don't have a Facebook account. And I'm like, do you have a TV? <laughs> And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, then you understand what commercials look like, right? Yeah. Do you know how Facebook works? And they don't. So you've got this natural resistance to moving on, because it's uncomfortable. There's the privacy issue. I remember talking to one company, and I was talking about doing um, 
uh, HR, she was, she, was, she was the <laughs> HR manager. She was talking to me about doing HR online. I said, that's cool. I said, what's your profile? No, 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 I'm not online. <laughs> Privacy, I don't like people seeing my photographs. But she wants to hire people online. You know what I mean? It doesn't work. <laughs> Social media is a fad, is another thing I hear. It is not a fad, okay? It is not a fad. Facebook might disappear tomorrow. The empowered consumer is here to stay. In fact, the mass media is an aberration in history. The radio was only invented 80 years ago. TV, about the time that I was born. Okay? That, those things may be facts. Being social is the most natural thing on earth. We're just being social right now on the internet. My ad agency takes care of Facebook and Twitter. Your ad agency can't take care of Facebook and Twitter. Not because they're no good. I have a lot of respect for ad agencies. Not for I spend my life with those ad agencies. <coughs> you can't live a brand unless you are the brand. You have to be on Facebook and Twitter. Then I get the next thing. It's too risky. I don't want customers complaining. Well, fix your goddamn product. <laughs> and how about getting some valuable feedback from customers so that you know how to fix it, right? And then I get the other one. I'm too busy to play around on Facebook. Okay? Then I quote companies like Zappo, where the CEO is like the chief Facebook officer, <laughs> right? And that company's become like one of the largest retailers in the world. I know a Greek company, I was talking to them a week ago, very visionary, very visionary. The CEO said to me, I'm stepping down as CEO so that I can focus on social media. Bravo. That's how organizations learn and adapt to snakes. You can't control your marketing in social media. Hello? Of course you can't. You participate in it. And this is the biggest obstacle. We've got this culture of control. Yeah. You let go. You share. Marketing is jazz. That's my hero, by the way, Miles Davis. Marketing is jazz. And these are just a couple of thoughts on where I think marketing is going, and I think management is going there too. Okay? We used to operate with a script. We had a business plan. We had a marketing plan. We stood up like conductors in an orchestra, and we had the orchestra in front of us, and we made each person play his part. If he didn't, we fired them. Right? Or we forced them to get a new violin. Not to tune the violin, at least. By the way, I was watching the opera one night in Milan, it just came to me. And I saw one guy standing like this for three hours, with symbols in his hand. Right? And you know what he did for three hours? Once he went like this. Whoosh, <laughs> and I said to myself, oh my God, what if he misses his cue? <laughs> he goes home, his wife says, how was work today? He says, I <laughs> So marketing is jazz. Jazz is relentless innovation. You never play the same tune the same way. Never. No way. You can't repeat jazz. You can't play jazz if you don't really understand music deep inside. But you have to let go of what you know. You have to lose the fear. That's what makes it swing. Jazz is one big conversation between the music and the setting, between the player and his instrument, between the player and the group, between the group and the audience, between the people in the audience. Yes, jazz is a conversation. It builds community. If anybody's been inside a jazz club, you know what I'm talking about. While the music's playing, the whole place just gets together. Okay? Marketing is like this. Marketing is like this. A jazz group is multiple expressions of the same mind. I said the same mind. So marketing, branding becomes an important internal function to guide the organization in its learning process. Okay. Guides behavior, shapes image, which is why I said we need to brand Greeks, not Greeks, by the way. The music chooses the leader. That's a scary thought for anybody who's a leader, right? I'm a CEO, my market doesn't choose me. The market does choose you, but news me. Okay? So all of this is scary stuff, but this is the way, this is where the world is. And learning organizations have to get into playing chair. <coughs> Disruption. I want to talk a bit about Greece. I just want to address this issue about can a nation be a learning nation? 
By the way, a remarkable picture. That is not a 2011 picture. It was shot in 2008 when the young kid was, uh, was shot by the police. We were all those That picture could obviously have been taken in 2011. It could have been taken in Madrid with the Indignados. It could have been taken in New York with the 99% movement from London with the recent riots. It could have been taken in the 60s. Right? This confrontation between people and the system <coughs> with a system that is clearly out of touch. Institutions that just don't get it anymore. <coughs> and this is not a Greek phenomenon, by the way. It's a global phenomenon. You can see it all over the world. We are feeling it very acutely. But this is disruption. It's a huge disruption. It's a snake. It's a snake. That kid's face, by the way, it speaks to me. Because that kid, he hasn't given up. He's not aggressive. He's like, show me the way to the future. It's like, please get out of my way. Give me a break. And the message that I, I keep pushing through is that you have to create your way out of this crisis. It's like stepping over the snake. There is no formula that we know. And I get back to this curve. And if you look at the situation, in 1980, our political system was in order. Okay. It's been around for like 30 years. It's achieved penetration. Okay? Deep penetration. Okay. And suddenly, it's designed to appeal to the laggards in society, or to include the laggards in society. But on this side of the curve, right, we're living in a different world. It's 2012. It's the world that I've just described to you. And I meet these amazing young people, like you guys today, by the way, who don't get what's going on over here. And that's understandable. And my big question is, can the state learn? I think the state has to. Look at this. This is from the World Bank. And it's an index of how easy it is to do business in various countries around the world. I think there were 180 countries on this list. Number one, no surprise, Singapore, Hong Kong, New Zealand, didn't know that. United States, Denmark, Norway, United Kingdom, Korea, Iceland, didn't know that. Where are we? Number 100. <laughs> just below the Yemen Republic, <laughs> just above Papua, Papua, <laughs> New Guinea, Paraguay, the Seychelles, Lebanon, Pakistan, the Marshall Islands, who the hell knows where that is? <laughs> Guatemala, Jordan, I mean, look at our Parea. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> Do we need to learn? Big time. I want to show you some indexes. Ease of doing business index, that's the sum of all of these, 100 out of 180, I think. Starting a business, 135. Dealing with construction permits, we're pretty good there, 41. Getting electricity, 77. I mean, do me a favor. The 77th most difficult country in the world to get electricity. What are we using, mules? <laughs> Registering property, 150. Getting credit, 78. Protecting investors, 155. How can you attract investment when you've got a protecting investors index of 155? Who's going to come and invest? What's this one? Paying taxes, not bad, 83. <laughs> trading across borders. We're part of the EU, right? We have trading across borders index of 84. What is this? What's this? Enforcing contracts, our legal system, 90 for the Rome. Resolving insolvency, 57. I mean, let me show you. We need to learn. Okay. It is the foremost task of this generation to reimagine our institutions. That, by the way, is a statement from Tom Peters in a book called Reimagine, written in 2003. Okay. It's urgent. Learning is not compulsory, but neither is survival. Okay. It has to be done. By the way, to wait to reform these institutions, which are here, you know, my message to, to everybody is, in it there. Just do it. Though. Just get it happening. Okay? Just get it happening. And then spread it out into society. Because the more you move along that curve, the less relevant that thing over there becomes. And that's what we do.
one simple reason. Get it. You thought I wouldn't finish with that, right? <laughs> Very quickly, um, fixing the product and creating a new future. What's the time frame? I mean, is that I, I kind of, I understand it, but is there a contradiction in terms there? Because how long is that going to take, and what does it take? Because you don't want to promote a broken product yeah. until you fix it. Right. Yeah. But let me let, let me turn that around. I think the reason our product is broken is because we have lost touch with with our basic DNA. The DNA I'm not talking about physiological DNA, biological DNA, I'm talking about our DNA, our concept. Okay. And and you know, it, it gets back to and I always quote this case, the Apple case. Apple was bankrupt in nineteen seventy seven. There was no new product. There was nothing. Nothing. We came out of the commercial called Think Different, which was designed to do one simple thing. Number one to align people inside the organization. We spent a lot of money on outside communication to do that, but to do something else, to get the people who really cared about that, who, by the way, were declining rapidly every month, and to let them re-understand what the essence of Apple was all about, okay? On the back of that, right, R&D started frantically developing product, and a year later, out came that big colored iMac, which you may remember. A couple of years after that was the iPod, and then history just kind of went. My strong feeling is that in this connected world, where brand is not something that you simply wrap around product, in this connected world where everything is interrelated, it's got to start with the why I'm doing things, which is brand, and then move into the what and the how. Okay? So it's, I, I know it's a controversial issue. That's my very firm belief, though. You start with why you're doing things, and then you move into what to do and how to do it. It's the vision. But it's more than vision, it's a shared narrative. It's something that we can all share together, so when we're not assembled like this, we all know what to do until we get back together again. Look at it like that. It's a narrative. Great brands have got great narratives. Think of Nike. Best narrative in the world. Avis, we try harder. What a narrative. It aligns everybody. Any other, we got two more questions before we... I'm really inspired that we see that live and not in the form of a TED talk uh, in our PCs. Uh, first of all, you said about the tremendous power that we, did, that we get from the network. And this is actually a point that's very interesting. And as you said that you can market something from a social network and a social media, we need to understand that a tweet or a Facebook post can actually fluctuate uh, financial markets too. Yes. And one thing, about this is that as you, you can create a brand and um, push it through through the social media, we can see that videos like Corny, for example, or any initiatives like that, can actually create even a change in how the status quo is. Yes. And create revolution as yes. we saw the Arab Spring. Totally, totally. The power is unbelievable. I'll give you. I'll give you my. Sorry, you want to carry on? Yeah, one, and one thing. And my opinion. I would like to listen about your opinion on things about uh, ACTA, SOPA and BIPA, which actually try to censor this kind of thing that we're talking about, networks. What's your opinion on yeah. this? You know, uh, I, I don't think that you can, at the end of the day, you know, to try to censor, to try to censor networks is, is nuts. But it's like trying to censor the village. Um, and, and I get back to my definition of social media. Social media is the cafe neon. Think about it as a village. It's just become a little larger. It's on steroids. You can't censor that, for God's sake. You're going to suppress 
essential vital conversation. You had to disconnect yourself from, 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 from what's really going on in the world. To me, it, it's nuts to censor, to censor Netflix. It's nuts. It's crazy. It's crazy. And we can see what happened, by the way, in North Africa when they try to censor. Right? That didn't work for them at all. Because you bypass stuff. There are things called hackers in this world. We'll find our way around it. It's, it's in our nature to be social. It's the most natural thing on earth. The world is just going back to it. Can you hear from stand up? If you can stand up here, yeah, then So, this question actually more. Get, get the the microphone. Yeah. So, mostly the question derives from the video you have on the YouTube about the brand of Grace. And I was wondering, since you have a great number of opportunities to talk to journalists, newsmakers, and politicians from abroad, what do you think is the major misunderstanding concerning Greece, and what is its actual um, cause? Sorry. Okay. Let, let's start with the cause. The cause is very simple. There is no crisis management mechanism in place in Greece. Which I think is the biggest mistake that this country could possibly make. I was involved in the crisis at Perrier, which I think was the late 80s, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where there were some trace elements of benzene found in uh, Perrier, which is enough to close down a company which calls itself uh, Earth's First Soft Drink, which was their slogan at the time, because it's all about purity, right? Yeah. And then suddenly you got like, you know, pollution inside this pure water. It was a disaster. And, and I remember being involved in, in, in the crisis management. We locked ourselves in rooms and we handled everything so precisely. We knew what to say, we knew what not to say, we knew what to do, we knew what questions just to ignore. I mean, it was unbelievable. I spoke to a diplomat the other day uh, from one of the embassies around the world, our embassies, and she said to me that there is absolutely no directive coming out of Athens. I was shocked. I was completely shocked. I said, well, what do you do? She says, well, you know, a journalist calls me and I just answer. Now, if you've got 25, 35, 100, 200, 1,000 people just answering, what's going to happen to the image of Greece? What's going to happen to the news? It's going to get, it's going to be whatever it is. There's nothing guiding it. There's no conversation happening, right? Which is why, by the way, we did that ad a couple of weeks ago, Give Greece a Chance, which is precisely to correct that. Now, the specific dimensions you're going to find, especially in Europe, are two. Number one, the stereotypes which are basically the Zorba stereotype, which comes from another problem, that our image is very much a 60s kind of image, right? very attractive. But the flip side of Zorba is Klefti, okay? is Tebeli, the flip side of it. The nice side is he gives me life, he's got a passion for life. But the German thinks that he's paying for Zorba to give him life. He doesn't want to do that, nor would I want to do that. But this is perception. So you've got the stereotypes, and you've also got the, um, the, um, the, uh, the misunderstanding, or the lack of understanding, on what has actually been achieved so far. I mean, the Greeks have made huge sacrifices. Look at the unemployment, for God's sake. Look at the way that salaries and, and, and pensions have been dropping. And, and you know, that was an attempt just to put some other stuff into the equation. So there's a bit of balance restored, but there is no balance restored. But we tend to blame the media. It's not the media's fault. And I keep saying this, and it's very unpopular sometimes. We are to blame for everything. Everything. Okay, so we've had our three questions. I guess. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you.